question I get asked all the time is what advice I'd give to someone who wants to study astrophysics or be an astrophysicist when they grow up, as much as any of us ever do. And the advice that I always give is learn how to code. Astronomy is a science that progresses at the pace of technology. It took a giant leap forward when we invented the telescope, it took another giant leap forward when we invented computers. The faster technology progresses, the faster astronomy progresses, and with recent developments in telescope design and advances in computational power, we are in another accelerating phase. In astronomy we're benefiting from a massive deluge of new data. A few years ago the Hubble Space Telescope was the best thing we had. It would send us around 3 gigabytes of data every day. James Webb Space Telescope JWST, sends us around 60 gigabytes right now, and it's only going to get more data intensive from here on out. The Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, just launched in a few years, is going to send us around 1.4 terabytes of data every day. The Event Horizon Telescope, a network of radio telescopes around the world, that generates around 40 terabytes of data every day. And when the Square Kilometre Array comes online, it's expected to produce around 11 exabytes of data, 11 million terabytes. No human can process all of that data by hand. The days of doing manual calculations on a few different objects, they're gone. Today we're in the era of big data. Today we code. My name's Thomas Rintoul, I'm a PhD student in astrophysics at Cardiff University, and in this video we're going to talk about the five different ways that I use code in my work as an astrophysicist. Before we launch into how I use code, let's just be clear on what I mean when I talk about coding. When I talk about coding, I'm talking about computer code or programming. This is a tool used everywhere in academia and industry. It's how we tell a computer what we want it to do. You can think of a program as a recipe, as a series of instructions we give the computer, telling it what to do, how to do it, and in what order. Unfortunately, I can't just point my computer at some data and say, do the science. It won't do that. I have to talk to it in a language it will understand. There are countless programming languages that you can use. They're all good for different things. For example, you may have seen URLs, web addresses, that end with .html. This means that the website you're viewing has been written in a language called HTML. This is a language that web browsers like Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Firefox and Safari can all understand. They know how to take that code and turn it into a website. It's great for websites, but you probably won't find video games written in HTML. The reason for this is that for video games you need to be able to define a character and process a load of inputs really quickly. For that you want something really fast and really flexible, and that's why a lot of video games are written in C++. But in astronomy we are dealing with a lot of data that needs to be read in, processed and visualised. And ideally we don't want to have to write loads of different programs to do all of those things individually. This is why the vast majority of the astronomy community, myself included, do the vast majority of our coding in Python. Python is a really powerful coding language that benefits from not having really high barriers to entry. It's very human readable, it follows syntax the same way language does. It's also really flexible and really powerful, it can do just about everything that most people want it to do. Python can take in the raw data from simulations or telescopes, it can do all of the analysis you want, and spit out plots and visualisations at the end, all within one script. And when you think about all of that, it's no wonder it's become so popular. Now that we know what coding is, let's talk about how I use code as an astrophysicist. I'm going to take you through the entire journey from data collection right through to the final product. I am an astrophysicist, an astronomer, but I'm not an observer. Rather, I'm a theorist, I'm a computational astrophysicist. So the first way I use code is in simulations. I use simulations to explore the physics of what's going on inside an astrophysical system. In my case, I study galaxy evolution. Now, an astrophysical simulation is sadly not something like the holodeck from Star Trek. Rather, it's an incredibly complex program running on huge 
supercomputers. In these programs, we've coded all of the laws of physics that are important for the astrophysical systems we're interested in. For me, that means running codes that have all the laws of physics for studying galaxy evolution, specifically the gaseous atmosphere around a galaxy called the circumgalactic medium. These programs are incredibly big, they need to be incredibly fast, and for that reason they're actually not written in Python. Python would be too slow for this. Rather, they're written in languages that are much more specialised and much faster. Languages like C and Fortran. Normally these codes are contributed to by loads of authors over years of work. Most astronomers will only contribute small bits and pieces to a larger code. These simulations are vast and like everything else we've talked about so far, produce a massive quantity of data. One of the simulations I ran earlier this year clocked in at 12 terabytes to process. 12 terabytes of data is a lot and it's hard to wrap your head around, but fortunately astronomy is a very visual science. It has to be. Almost everything we study we cannot get hands on with. We observe distant galaxies, we simulate them in computers, you can't just pick one up. Because we're such a visual science, we're so image driven, a big part of any astronomer's job is image processing. Taking that raw data and turning it into images that we can look at as a starting point. Image processing though is a science in itself. You can't just take your raw data, whack it on a plot and call it a day. You've got to apply some thought to it. In my work with simulations, it's about deciding which properties are the most important to explore and plotting those ones. It's about being able to turn 3D simulation data into a two-dimensional plot on a page. For observers, it's about processing light we can't see into images we can then understand. Code is brilliant for this because every bit of data is different. A code that would work really well for data from the Hubble Space Telescope will not work for my simulations. I need something specialised for my work. So what I do is I use code that I've written in Python to load in my raw data, get it into a format that I can then work with, and then use predefined Python functions to turn those ones and zeros into a beautiful image that I can then start to interpret. Once we've got these images, we come to the next step, the next way that I use code in my work, which is data analysis. Images are wonderful and a picture really is worth a thousand words, but they don't tell us the whole story. This is where data analysis comes in. It's processing that data in a way that we can express things numerically. So it could be for an observer looking at how an object moves on the sky and how bright it is and working out how far away that object is. It could be analysing its spectrum to see what it's made of. It could be combining loads of different observations of the same object to look for exoplanets in the light curves of stars. For theorists like me, it's about digging into what's going on in the simulations, calculating useful properties like densities, temperatures, pressures, and exploring those distributions, exploring how they change to understand what's going on physically within these systems. And when one of my simulations clocks in at 12 terabytes, there's not really a good way to do this without code. Code lets me apply mathematical and statistical tests to my data in a way that I just couldn't do if I was having to go through all of this by hand. And while a load of numbers describing something is great and is vital for science, it's not really the best thing if you're trying to engage somebody or just quite frankly trying to parse something in a hurry. This is where the fourth way that I use code comes in. Data visualisation. Now data visualisation can take many different forms. It can be everything from the simple bar charts to pie charts, line graphs showing the evolution of a property over time. It can be histograms, 2D histograms or even the projections that I produce at the start of my analysis. All of this is data visualisation. It's a huge part of communicating science to the public and to other scientists through papers and through talks at conferences, and because so many astronomers, like myself, do our data analysis in Python, we'll also use Python for producing our data visualisations using packages like matplotlib and seaborn. And when I put it like that, data visualisation sounds really simple, but it isn't. There are some really, really good visualisations out there. There are also some absolutely shocking ones. I'm actually going to make a whole video on how to make good visualisations, good plots, good graphs 
and why some of them are so terrible. So make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss that video. But that does now bring us to the end of how I use code. But I do have one bonus method of using code that I don't use personally, but others in my field do. And that's called mock observations. Now you might be wondering, what is a mock observation? Well, what it is, is a fake image of an object, say a galaxy. And I know what you're thinking, why would we want to make fake images? Are we trying to mislead people? No, we're not. Of course we're not. The reason we'd make mock observations is to test our models against real observations. The way that these mock observations work is you create a lot of simulations, a lot of fake galaxies, simulated galaxies. In that code, you've got a way for it to emit light and you can record what light it would have emitted. You can send that simulated light through a program that will make it be received the same way that light from the universe would be received by that telescope. You get some mock images out as if they've been observed by that telescope, but they are simulated galaxies. Then you just compare your real observations to your mock observations. And when they look the same, you have a better idea of what's going on in the real galaxy because you know what's going on in the simulated one. And remember how I said back at the beginning of the video how astronomy progresses at the pace of technology? Well, that is the key to this technique. It has got so much more effective with advances in machine learning, a subset of AI. You can train your machine learning model to make these associations between a mock observation and a real observation much faster than any human could possibly do. This is letting us have a better idea of what may be going on inside real galaxies. The only key now is you've got to make sure your simulations are as accurate as they can be, which means you've got to get the code right. I hope this has been a really interesting insight into how I and other astronomers use code in our work. If this is something you want to get into, you want to get into astronomy, or you want to get into other sciences like other areas of physics, maths, engineering, I cannot recommend learning to code enough. It doesn't have to be in Python. Learn to code in any language. It will make life so much easier for you going forward. Like I mentioned before, I'm going to make that whole video about data visualization and why some plots are utter garbage so make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon while you're down there make sure you like the video and comment below with any questions comments suggestions i do really read them if you're looking for something else to watch there's some recommended viewing on the screen now and all that leaves is for me to say thank you very much for watching and i'll see you in the next one